Well, I'd like to welcome everyone to the special meeting of the Guyman City Council. Item one, call to order. Item two, attendance roll call. Living good? Here. Peterson? Here. Swager? Here. Alvedras? Egger? Present. Hoffman? Here. Mr. Petty? Here. Mr. Denham? Present. Item three, discussion and possible action on the continued opening of the business of business according to the state of Oklahoma open up and recover safely ours plan well uh, what I'll do is uh, as part of this is opening up I'll just kind of give you the current statistics for Texas County and Guyman as the, as was published on the Oklahoma Health Department's website this morning uh, this afternoon uh, Texas County had increased their number of positives by 56. That brings Texas County up to 752 positives. Uh, there's still only four deaths uh, being reported and recoveries went up four to 322. Uh, that's uh, the 56 is about a 9% a day increase. Uh, the city of Guymon has increased the positive count from 568 to 619, which is 51 people. All four, all four of the deaths are Guymon residences. Uh, the recoveries for Guymon increased three to 240. Texas County remains number three in the county, uh, in the state as far as the county ranking is concerned. Uh, but Sunday, Diamond surpassed Tulsa and is now ranked number two in the state of Oklahoma. I know that currently CDC is in Guyman to help with communications, to promote social distancing. Uh, if we're looking at net cases, uh, there were 48 net cases for Guyman and a total of, total net of 379. That would be the number of positives less the number of recovered. Uh, Texas County is 52 um, with a total net of 430. And those are the statistics as I know them right now. Grant, is there anything additional that needs to be added to that at this time? I don't think so. Okay. We do have uh, representatives from the uh, Oklahoma Regional Health Department. The director, Terry Sols Salisbury. And we do have, I believe we've got representatives from maybe CDC here, uh, but I do not know their names, so I'll let them introduce themselves if you call on them okay. or ask questions of them. If any of you guys would like to come up and speak, feel free to step up to the mic and just introduce yourselves. That way we can kind of try to put a face to the name. Ms. Salisbury, would you like to fill us in on what the area is doing? Okay, certainly. Um, I'm going to get the girls' names wrong because, like, I know I'm going to. Uh, <laughs> this is Rex, and I'm not even going to try to do the last names. I'm not that good at names. This is Scott. No, you don't have to. He's not here. Christy, Christy, Christy and Marissa. And they're all from the CDC. They arrived last Tuesday. We met Tuesday evening. Uh, I met with them. And their purpose in Guyman is to decrease the spread of COVID-19 in our county. And they're going, the, their attempts to do this is by communication, to understand the disease spread, and they'll do that like with, they're, they're advising us on public service announcements and uh, radio ads, that sort of thing. 
and they'll also provide technical support to strengthen community capacity and by recommending proven methods to slow the spread of the disease and provide community more information. And while they've been here, they have been or will be partnering with the business sector, public safety sector, local government, and faith-based organizations. And they've met with several already. And they will be here through this Saturday and continue to meet with, with people while they're here. I have some fact sheets that, sort of samples, that one of the things that has been noted is the as widespread as it could be in Germany. And so this is something that we'll be posting on our Facebook and it's also on the CDC website. And it's a fun making a different clock map, different ways, different non foci types. And Thank you. Okay. And then in addition, <coughs> one of the uh, That last one that's coming out is a um, kind of a diagram on businesses on whether or not they recommend opening or, or what they should do once they're open. Is there any questions that I could answer or, or one of the individuals from CDC could answer for y'all? I've got a question. This is from CDC guidelines for restaurants and bars. Okay. And after you say, should you open or not consider opening, it says our recommended health and safety actions in place. Promote healthy hygiene practices such as hand washing and employees wearing a cloth face covering as feasible. Would you explain as feasible to me? I'm going to let one of my cohorts here explain as feasible. This is Rex Howard speaking. As feasible is clearly up to interpretation, but for the most part that would mean a health condition, say someone who's not able to pass a respiratory fit test, that's typically what we say, decreased lung capacity, or they're working hard enough that it'll require them to say, pant or breathe very hard and it becomes so restrictive they cannot get enough oxygen. But for most indoor movement, if without a specific medical condition, feasible would be to wear it. So the people who need to wear it, <coughs> theoretically can't. Well, Meaning if they have respiratory problems, well, <clears throat> they're the ones a, who need to wear it. Potentially a misunderstanding of what a cloth face mask does. It is actually not to protect the wearer. Right now, this doesn't really filter. This is not an N95 mask. Surgical mask and cloth mask both were never designed for that in mind. What they do is they pr protect the exhalation. So if I were asymptomatically infected. I have virus, but for whatever unknown reason, I am not showing any signs or symptoms, which we know is the case with some people with this virus. As I'm speaking in the air currents, instead of traveling out to her, you're gonna stay right here with me. So really the wearing of a cloth face mask is a protection of others. This is much. We uh, I also have an N95 face mask with a different variety of hers, and this is much easier to breathe through, much less restrictive. So one of the biggest concerns that we had, and we've all probably last week, all of us probably got over 200, 250 calls, Wednesday and Thursday, uh, was cross contamination. A lot of folks, you know, think 
because they're not going to know how to take the mask off. They're going to be reaching up with their fingers, right? All those things. Uh, when we're talking about a restaurant, we're talking about high school kids who, right? I mean, we're, let's just be honest. We're paying them a minimum wage. We tell them to do this, but you know as well as I do, they're going to walk in back and pull it off. We've all put up insulation. I know that's how I take one off. So, I mean, I discussed the reason the CDC changed its recommendations yeah. because the CDC <laughs> recommendations for a while were not. Okay. So, hi, this is Scott Sudweeks. I'm uh, serving as the communications lead to support the field team here. I'm having trouble here. Can we I, think turn? I think it's the mic. Yeah. I'll try a little closer. Okay. Speak louder. How's that? Is that Great. okay? Yes. Uh, sorry about that. My name is Scott Sudweeks, and I'm uh, serving as the, the communications lead for our field team here in Guyman. So the question, as I understand it, sir, was uh, how do you avoid cross-contamination or what kind of information is available? So let me back up for a moment. So getting back to the original question about the restaurant guidance, it's not intended to be prescriptive. It's supposed to be here are the main things that uh, an operator can do to, uh, to if they choose to open, uh, how to protect not only their workforce, but more importantly, uh, their customers and minimize the spread of COVID in the community. The second thing is, of course, uh, no mask or measure is perfect. So as you rightly pointed out, uh, Mr. Eger, that it does require some training and understanding of limitations of the mask and how to safely put it on and take it off. So that guidance is also available. And uh, in the packet of information we provide, it does give information in detail how to put it on, how to take it off. So the restaurant guidance is one piece, but it's intended to go in hand in hand with how do you wear a mask to protect yourself? And also, we we'll take it on and off without touching your face and contaminating your hands. So typically, in a nutshell, you would want to wash your hands before you, if you may touch your face inadvertently, well, before you take your mask off. All right. Then, then wash your hands again and prior to having it on. So it would be up to the, uh, the restaurant owner to uh, monitor that, certainly with some assistance if need be, or, or clarity from the health department. Uh, but we would hope that that information that we provided would be uh, clear enough and there's always a reach back capability to go back to the CDC website for further information or they can contact their local or state health officials for guidance. I think so the that, education, is it, it is, but let's just be honest and real here. We're talking 14 year old kids, 15 year old sure. kids, right? I don't know if you have kids, but I do. I do sir. It's a lot more than one training session it to is. teach them to pick up their glass. It <clears throat> we just do the best we can and provide okay. as much information and also stress why it's important to do that not only within the workplace but out in the community as a whole and at home. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I've got a question. You mentioned that. Um... Sorry. You mentioned that. You, one of the observations y'all had was that uh, Guyman, you did not see the mask worn as prevalently, prevalently in Guyman as you have other places. Obviously, we can look around here in the room. Most of us are not wearing a mask. Uh, our attorney is the safest one here. Um, <laughs> how, how do we get that message out uh, that that is an important factor to help prevent the spread because there are so many mis mixed messages out there now that even I as I said around you know when do I need to wear a mask and when do I not you know if I'm going into a heavy heavily populated place like Walmart okay yeah I know I ought to be wearing a mask but if I'm sitting here in my office and I'm just surrounded by the people that work with me is it really that important? Hello, Rex Howard again. It is a little bit situationally dependent. I do not wear this in my car. I do not wear this when I clearly can see 50 yards around me in every direction. There's no one around. That would really be asinine. The biggest guidance are is enclosed spaces because any virus that is coming from someone's mouth or nose is going to stay concentrated. Outdoors, you could probably say it's better. Social distancing is the other thing. If you wanted to sit in the driveway and talk with your friend 10 yards away and you're both in your chairs, 
There would be absolutely, I mean, not even 10 yards, five yards. We talk about six feet and six feet I would consider a minimum. You know, a little bit far, further is better. If you're 20 feet apart, there's, there would be no reason to, uh, unless a strong fan is right beside you as you're coughing and blowing the wind directly toward them would be sufficient. But when we're talking about, say, a restaurant customer service, someone at a front desk who's, they only have this distance, four feet between them, someone's coming over, leaning on the counter, handing them a credit card, you hand, an act of handing a credit card, I would definitely come within that bubble of six feet where you start to get an exponential increase of particles emanated from that other person, including potentially virus particles. So it's between Ms. Hoffman and you, Mr. Dunham, I mean, you're looking at what, 10 feet? Seems very reasonable. You have very good airflow circulation. If you're on cubicles that were kind of packed in or desks right across from each other, or even both of you on that same smaller table, this one's a little bit longer and Mr. Petty is uh, wearing a mask as well. That's hard to put into specific wording, I understand, but you could definitely argue that customer service workers and wait staff are going to regularly be coming inside those bubbles and would definitely be people that. Well, and, and I understand that, and that makes a lot of sense, but in our morning staff meeting this morning, uh, we had discussions where there were people driving around and you, we witnessed, you know, parties in the front yards that people were elbow to elbow in the front yard. Obviously, well, they're thinking outside and safe blah 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 but they didn't have that distance between them and somehow we if that's the if that's the trigger and that's what we've got to preach somehow we've got to be able to get that word out to our community who is multilingual and diverse <coughs> and trying to get that message to them to stress that importance yeah. because I can walk into Walmart today and Maybe 50% of the people will be wearing a mask uh, or taking those safety precautions. And what are you going to do? You've got, I mean, for, for Guyman, if you're going to buy groceries in Guyman, that's the only place you're going to go. You're 100% correct. These gatherings, large gatherings, have been something that consistently have been mentioned, be they family or, or distant relations or not relations all having parties and yes they're outside but that doesn't in no way eliminates the threat and I would say that's just as likely as if they were indoors when they're elbow to elbow the, as far as communications we are developing some ideas at the state level that are about to be start becoming implemented there are some radio some radio messages however we have some more ideas that are communications expert yeah yes. sure so so what we're talking about is, is key I mean there's there's three things just relying on a mask exclusively is not going to be sufficient. You know, it's really, it's, it's a, it's a three legs of a stool. One is wearing a mask to prevent your sharing potential germs. You can feel your asymptomatic or not, you don't know. So wearing the mask, just as a courtesy, uh, uh, pick if you're with it, so it's not your family. Can you speak into, The Thank second you. item would be uh, hand hygiene, ensuring that you are washing your hands. Social distancing is the third component avoid touching your face. You've heard this in the message before. So why isn't this happening more? Well, there's many, many reasons. One is, as you pointed out, Mr. Dunham, there is a lot of inconsistency and lack of understanding and some confusion and clarity, lack of clarity about why to wear a mask, how does this bug spread in the community, and some ways that people have control over how to spread that, but also how to take care of themselves and their, their families. So one strategy that we're doing, and it's part of the reason why we're here, is to help understand what information has been going out to the community, what are, and how well has that been un understood, and where can we find opportunities to increase that understanding. So we are working with the state and the local health department to put together some public service announcements. We are out in the community to uh, identify who are influencers and leaders in the community that we can help channel messages through. And you're right, it's a complicated situation because you have a, a, a ethnically diverse community, with different rates of literacy, so we have to approach this at multiple levels of communication. 
uh, in Gaiman and in the, and in the, in the surrounding area. But um, we're trying to reinforce the information that's already out there. And it is complicated, but we want to help people understand how does this spread and how do you stop it and how can you take control over your choices and also how to help you, know, you take care of each other. You know, Gaiman it clearly is a great community and people care about each other and they care about their elders and the most sensitive groups in the, in the community and they want to do the right thing. We want to help them understand what the right thing is, how to help themselves, how to help their community and get us back to normal as soon as possible. So, so Scott, are you guys here tonight to ask us to help you in some way or just letting us know what you're doing or what's... I think, well, in, in our role with, with supporting the state and local health department, our primary function is to uh, provide technical assistance and ideas and visibility on what's worked in other communities and really uh, help strengthen uh, the capabilities of the existing health department. Uh, and, and you know, the state and, lo and local level and uh, help them uh, do an even better job beyond what they're already doing because they're doing a significant amount of work. It's a tough situation and they are firing on all cylinders. And uh, in, in my time here, we only in one week, I have been so impressed with the dedication uh, on the part of the, the, the health department here, both at the, the local and state level. There's a great deal of amount of work to do, but um, you know, it, it is tough and it's scary. It's a complicated situation, um, but I am optimistic that uh, we keep our eyes on the prize when we work together. We're, we've been building a great team, a good coalition. We welcome, welcome involvement and in, in, in support from, from uh, local government here. And we also want to ensure that there's information that you or your community needs. Uh, we'll do the best we can to help uh, support the uh, local agency in providing that to you. What do you say to individuals that don't want to wear a mask because they've read literature saying that if you wear a mask, you're more acceptable to catch pneumonia or hurting your lungs in the long run? Well, again, as, as Dr. Howard was saying, some folks, you know, let, let's be frank, wearing a mask is uncomfortable. It's different. It's new. Um, people have misunderstandings sometimes of how much protection it serves. One big step is understanding why do you want to wear it? It's not just to protect me, it's to protect you. And you wearing a mask protects me. We protect the people who are vulnerable in our population, the folks who have a, are health compromised, the elderly. Um, so there's a lot of, as you said, and as Mr. Dunham said, misinformation or lack, perhaps lack of understanding about why a mask is important. What does it do? And so what do I say to po folks? I say, we depend on each other to uh, solve this problem. We can't, we're, none of us are islands. We depend on each other to support you know, our community. And um, uh, we appreciate the leadership on the part of the, the health department and uh, in the local community. We have had great uh, support so far from uh, the sheriff department, uh, as well as um, folks at Seaboard and, and with the union. So, you know, we're, again, we're trying to find some solutions and build some capacity so that when we leave, hopefully we can leave some recommendations and help that be sustained in the long run. Did that address your question? No, it's off on a tangent. I mean, you know, they have their beliefs and they have some studies that they say are, you know, say that wearing a mask is not healthy. Well, I, I am not aware of, of any data that indicates that uh, wearing a mask increases someone's uh, likelihood of developing pneumonia. Actually, I believe it might just be the opposite. Not that, but the concern would be someone else spreading germs that you might pick up, not, not yeah, have someone like you becoming more ill. Okay. okay. Thank you, sir. Chief, as far as hospitalizations, um, still making quite a bit of runs weekly. Uh, today's been our largest day. Right now we're currently on three different transfers as we speak. Um, today was a huge increase for us. Um, we, are, we do have a strike team in, in Guyman right now. Uh, the Regional Emergency Medical Services System is here providing at least one COVID unit. Lean up a little bit, Chief. In, we have a regional assets already here 
the uh, RIMS ambulances here. We do have a dedicated COVID unit that's transporting patients to whatever facilities that are accepting right now. Um, in addition to the units that we already have working on it. So um, medically speaking, over the weekend was, was light, um, but starting today, and it seems like uh, mid the afternoon is when we get a large, large portion of our calls. And uh, we are seeing a large, or a larger increase of 911 calls involving sick calls, difficulty breathing, shortness of breath uh, through the 911 calls also. Have we started receiving any numbers back from the testing at Seaboard? I'll have her answer that. Yes, we are receiving numbers back, uh, but our positives don't come in by employer. They come in as positives. So I don't have those numbers. I would defer that question to Seaboard as far as number of positives and negatives. But yes, those, those test results are coming back. Thank you. How are you finding out about the, um, the recoveries? The recoveries are based on the, uh, whenever we do a, we get a positive, the nurses go in and, and start that case in a computerized system. And the recommendation based on when they started having symptoms or if they, or when they were tested, if they're asymptomatic, then determines at what point they are considered recovered or can return to work. And at that point, they, they enter that date in with the instructions that if the, the patient's not improved or is having problems, we need to know. But, um, but that's the date at which that, that person's considered recovered. If they enter the hospital, then it's tracked because that's a reportable disease. And so it gets reported. They see that there's already a case open and so that, then that becomes the, um, the data for the hospitalization. Okay. Yes, I mean, I, I, well, I asked the question because, are you, I mean, I didn't quite understand. Are you doing those, are you doing individual background call? I mean, making phone calls to people. You know, we had 56 go in and we had 56 positives today. So we know in about 14 days, we need to be trying to contact those 56 people back to see, are you feeling better? Are you well? Are you, have you been admitted to the hospital? Did you get worse? What happened? Okay, we don't contact them back. They're instructed to contact us if they're not better after the time, the, the 14 days. Okay. And so at that point, if we have not heard from them, then they then, that, that date they're dropped off the list and considered recovered. Does that make sense? Yeah. With the, so with the numbers we have, we cannot, because we're also contacting their contacts. Right. I understand there are a lot of contacts trying to be made. Yes. yes. Yeah. So in someone fact, from a month ago is not lingering in there as active if you couldn't no, get hold of them. Because I could see that in our community. Yeah. <laughs> no, they, they, they fall off as they're considered recovered, you know, as, as the time limit expires. And it all depends on, you know, were they symptomatic when they started having or when they were tested in the positive state. That's how it's determined. I guess one other question I've got is uh, we've talked a lot about the mask and how important it is. Is Would you say that's the number one most important thing that people could be doing to help prevent the spread, help prevent the spread of the disease right now? I would say probably the number one thing that folks could do is get information to educate themselves and learn more about COVID and all the, varied, the, the, the variety of methods that they can use. Masking, as I had indicated uh, earlier, Mr. Dunham, is, is just one of several methods. Uh, it's critical also to have that social distance. It's difficult to do that sometimes, and it's, especially when you're in a, in a bar or neighborhood uh, gathering. We need to attack this issue on multiple levels. The social distancing, the improving hand washing, wearing the mask, or teaching people how to make a mask. Um, but really it's about understanding um, what we can do at personal level 
to help protect each other and support our first responders and our healthcare providers so they're not overwhelmed. Uh, and hang in there and support each other, help each other until we find a, a, a cure and get a vaccine. Uh, it's going to be a while and there's plenty of room for improvement, but uh, I'm hoping that by virtue of our being here and our, our contacts and our working together both with the community and health departments that we can get Guyman in a better place. Uh, this is also, a, you are aware, a regional issue beyond just the city itself. We've got folks who are moving back and forth across the Kansas border. Uh, you know, there's a lot of concern as to where, where did this start? We don't know. It's, it's nationwide, and it's difficult to know where did it come from. And, you know, pointing the fingers at someone or someplace may not get us where we need to go right now. We need to focus on what do we know, what do we need to do, and how do we get there together? You. Yeah. Like from the standpoint of your local health department, we, we feel that social distancing and the wearing masks, but social distancing is probably your primary thing you can do. Okay. And then, and then of course, wearing masks and then good hand hygiene. All three. Combination, but... Yeah, what was the last thing you said? Hand good hygiene. hand hygiene. Good hand hygiene. Either okay. washing or hand sanitizer yeah. frequently. How is... And you may know this answer. How is the Woodward Hospital holding out? Still beds available? Are they full? Are they? I'm going to defer that to Grant because he's the one transferring all the <laughs> As of an hour ago, they had two rooms open, and we just filled one of them. So I, they, as of right now, they should have one. And they're also working on what they call a step-down unit in Woodward. So patients that come from the that go immediately from the ICU U, ICU unit of the COVID they're going to go to a step down unit where they can be carefully monitored because a lot of these cases they go through a spell they're doing good they're doing good they're going then they get to go home or they use the step down unit and 13 days into it or a few days later immediately one and within just a few hours they have a deterioration and in, in change in their condition and have to be put back in ICU or monitored much closer. And that's kind of what we're seeing right now. We are seeing, like I said before, a, a lot of 911 calls of ours are coming up. Uh, there are patients uh, that are, some of them know that they're positive, they've been told. Some of them are still waiting for testing. And those are the ones that have been tested just recently, like within the last day or two. And they get sick and we're taking them to the hospital. Well, the results are still pending. So those are, different degrees that we have on. Um, I will say that I, I have to agree with what, what the State Department is saying and the CDC about um, personal protective equipment, especially the masks and stuff. As of today, we've taken about 32 different patients, long distance in the back of an ambulance, squared box. I mean, we're talking close environment. And we have done all the rec recommended procedures and we have the PPE in place. We're not going above and beyond. We don't have air tanks or anything like that but we do have the proper uh, masks and and we do the hygiene and all that and I have to this date none of the people that have gone on the transfers locally have come down with any symptoms so I will say that I'm, I'm proud to say that but it just takes one person not to do the right thing to take their mask off earlier early within contact with that patient or such that we would run into a problem so we are working on that. Can I ask you one more question, Grant? And it's kind of the elephant in the room. I don't want to put you on the spot. I know there's a lot of people in here, but do you feel like we're getting the help from the state that we need? Because one thing I feel like is the state's been slow to respond to the panhandle. Uh, not trying to start a fight, but I, I mean, I do feel like, you know, we could have, we seen this coming. We educated the city, Joe Don, putting out publications, Facebook. You know, we were trying to do what we could. Are you getting the help now that our cases are? As I've said before, this disease or this virus is not coming from Oklahoma City, never has. And I think we know because of our traveling, uh, yeah. the people in our community, it's what's going on between Amarillo and Dodge City and the 150 mile radius of Guymon. We're, we're dead smack dab in the middle of it. We saw early on those numbers starting to come. We saw that early on. And in my opinion, we had to wait a little bit for things to actually develop and start to get a hold on it. Now that things are rolling, yes. 
Absolutely. So in fact, I'll, I'll tell you, we I made the mention if, if I imagine right now if we ordered a a um, red lollipop and we wanted it to taste like green apple, we could probably get it. I mean, I mean that's um, good because one of my fears and one of the things I think we all agree on, and Grant, I think you do too, is this has been such a state-centric uh, effort to fix this. It's really hurt us where probably 90% of us go to the doctor in Amarillo if we have an issue. So I'm glad to hear that. Well, here's the thing. There is no fixing this. This is a virus. This is a virus just like any other virus. It's going to go. It's going to have its ways. It's going to go through here. It's going to move on. And, you know, there's still it may return different form different different factors on that later on in the year we don't know we have to deal with what we are de dealing with right now and the best we can do is stop the spread and and i will have to say the state department of health and the cdc has been doing that and, and putting that information out from the very beginning even when this was in china they put out to stop the spread but it is very very difficult across the nation and including our our area where we have so many different cultures and trying to explain that so it's not getting rid of the problem it is having to deal with it while it's here and tell and explain to people to stop the spread yeah i don't think anybody thinks it's going away i just want to make sure we're getting help for the ones who need it yes we are as far as ppe we feel like we're in a good spot i believe so um I believe there's many departments here that um, have been planning for this. Um, like back in February, we kind of saw this coming into January. We started stocking up as best we could so that when we knew the shortage was going to happen, and it did happen, and it is happening now across different places, um, we had PPE set in place for, I know, our personnel and basically first responders. Um, since that time, since places have slowed down, uh, the state warehouse and, and the federal government working with all that see where the hot spots are and can deliver more of those products now lessening the hoarding that has been going across the state and across the country they're releasing some of that stuff which is perfect for us now are we at a point now that if a person wants to get tested they can regardless if they're showing any of the symptoms yes sir we are we tested 172 at the activity center on Saturday. And um, that wasn't even a question. The only question we had was if they were under 16, because that's just not safe to do in a car with someone younger than 16. But everyone was tested that wanted to be tested. And we continue that at the curbside at the health department daily. Uh, we're providing the hospital and several physicians with kits so that they can test also. Thank you. And I will add that I, I believe on Friday, Walmart will start testing at their facility three days a week if you want to be tested. Free to the public. If you want to be tested, you can go out there and get tested. I think they told me they were going to do it on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, I think, is what I was, what I was told. And and this, my question, I mean, I guess is for, for Terry in Salisbury. Are we testing more here than other parts of the state because we know we've become a hot spot? Um, you know, how many tests did we even do last week? Uh, I can't tell you because <laughs> total. Uh, we, we probably tested around uh, 120 to 150 at the health department. We also send in those physicians and Cimarron memorials and the hospitals but i can't tell you without looking at sheets what those ran okay um in addition we had the 172 at the pod plus the seaboard testing we did so are we testing probably per capita yeah we're probably testing more than than elsewhere currently now earlier i'd say you know norman was testing probably as much as we're doing per capita now so it just it, it depends on how the disease is is running do you see this trend continuing of this volume of testing to go on in this region or is that do you think that slows down at some point um i think it all depends on how the positive if we if we continue to rise in positive cases i think we'll continue to have people wanting to be tested if it starts to wane i think that we will not have as many that seek to be tested 
So I think it all just depends on the, how the disease progresses. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. So, so from the start, one of the big deficiencies we've had in our response is, is the lack of data about and, and sufficient testing. So regular, frequent, and, and, and broad span of testing is going to be critical for us to make decisions uh, as a community, as a nation, on when to reopen, how much to reopen, and what the patterns of disease are in our community so that we can make decisions as to whether we need to ratchet back some of that or can go full board. So we really need to make that based on good, good data. And so the sampling likely will continue. Um, one thing that CDC has been doing to help the state and the community is um, identifying additional sources of analytical capabilities. More than just swabbing a nose and plugging it into a machine, you've got to find a lab that can actually test it sometimes or can actually process the sample. So there has been some backlogs um, and there's a lot of demand for testing and uh, we're, we've been uh, able to uh, find some additional resources for the state um, and have been trying to step up to help the state with, uh, with the, this backlog of testing to facilitate that a bit. So we're doing what we can to support your community and the state in that regard. As far as rapid testing, and I don't know who, who could answer this, I know that Abbott has a machine that people are using kind of around the country. Is it even possible for Texas County, maybe the Panhandle, to get rapid testing or a mass amount? Obviously, knowing as many positives are probably out there that, you know, we're waiting five days to seven days potentially for tests. Is, is there a way to get the rapid test out here for us? Actually, we do have the rapid test in Guymon right now. Um, the health department has one machine. It, it can only... Per our, our guidelines, the nurse practitioner is the only one that can run it. So when she's there once a week, if she sees someone consent, then she can run it. Dr. Um, Batista had three Abbott machines. And um, when the deputy commissioner was here visiting, we visited with Nancy Schmidt and, and Dr. Batista and Dr. Tan. And um, he needed reagents. They were, they didn't, it's very in, in short supply for the quick test. So we were able to supply him with some quick test, and he is he is now utilizing those. Okay. So it's it's limited, right? Just because of the reagent, okay. but it is here. Okay, thank you for answering that. Any other discussion? I, I've got one more question, just as an act of prevention. If a mask is um, in the top five. Of things to do wearing a mask top five things to do to prevent the spread how feasible is it for and I'm going to use Walmart as an example because I was there last night uh, yeah they've got a person standing at the door counting the number of people that are going in and coming out how feasible is it to actually get with those business owners and say uh, we want you to incur we want to encourage you to uh, give out masks for people that do not have them and where can we go find inexpensive or how can we get a hold of those inexpensive masks and that could be a form of messaging where we we say you know, as they walk in and out walk into Walmart so they're not wearing a mask uh, sir we would prefer for you to wear this thank you and here's if you this is something you want to do here's a way to hand here's a way to make your own So what I can tell you is in, uh, in other states, uh, we, we have visibility on how communities have been working together, together with their business partners. And Walmart has uh, been a great partner and been very proactive in that regard. I would imagine uh, if they were approached uh, with an ask and say this is the need, um, I would imagine uh, given their, their role in the community, they would be willing to step up. I'm not gonna speak for them, but I would imagine given my experiences with other communities they would. How to go about doing that? I'm sure it has to be negotiated with, with uh, the business community, um, but their leadership I think would be essential, both in uh, helping promote the idea of what, why it is, ensuring that their employees are continuing to mask, as well as their suppliers coming in, um, and, and uh, encouraging, not, uh, I don't know about supplying that to them, but sharing information on if you can't get a mask, buy a mask, 
you don't need to, you can make a mask right. and it's simple. And here's how you do it. What's important is you wear a mask and wear it right. And again, it's not just wearing a mask anywhere. It's like especially important when you're around someone who's more sensitive, like the elders in our community, who's more susceptible. That's when it's even more critical to be aware of that in combination with social distancing measures. Any other discussion? Okay, item four, discussion and possible action to authorize the mayor to sign an amended proclamation modifying the state of emergency that is in effect till June 9th, 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. <clears throat> I've, got, I've just got, I guess what would like an explanation of why on the second, the second page, the paragraph uh, items number five and number six. What? Commodities and goods and alcohol. What, alcohol and commodities and goods. Kind of the basis behind that. And is it necessary, I guess? I've had some questions from folks about that. Which ones were you looking at, man? It's that second uh, page, page two, the third paragraph. Items five and six, the sale and purchase of dispensing of alcohol beverage. Oh, the sale okay. and purchase of dispensing of other commodities or goods. I've had I've had some questions from some various business owners, not just the bars, but some of the restaurants and even one package uh, convenience. Well, I'll try to answer that, and uh, Mr. Petty may want to chime in if I get way off base because I'm not licensed to practice law, but I do some, some do that I do that sometimes. Um, but just remember, these are the governor's rules, not, not yeah. mine. <laughs> <laughs> um, what this mimics, this statement mimics what we have in our ordinance. And as you know, as a rule, we put everything that was in state statute into that ordinance so that if there ever was a time that we needed to um, limit the sale of alcohol um, or um, the dispensing or the sale, purchase, or dispensing of other commodities or goods, if there was ever a time that that would be needed then we would have the ability, we would have that tool in our tool chest to go in there and implement that. If there became a tornado. But, but my question is specific to the corona between now and June 8th. Well, it's not, part of, the, it's not part of that. that those first, those first two pages of whereas is are just restating what was in the ordinance. Okay. They do not have anything to do with the coronavirus. They do not have anything to do with the uh, the things that we are limiting now. Um, okay. In any shape, way, shape, or form. I mean, I I was I, I bought alcohol this weekend. Uh, you know, I yeah. After this meeting, I may be out buying alcohol again. I don't know, but <laughs> but. Um, but this, but part, that does but not. It does not limit the sale during this time. But it's all part of this proclamation. It is part of the proclamation because the whereas is gives the history of why we're doing the proclamation and what could be done in, during the proclamation. Uh, when you get down to out on page two, where it starts, and I do further proclaim, that's when the limitations start hitting. So I have a question, <clears throat> number seven, and while I think you guys did a great job, the CDC and the health department, <clears throat> employees at these facilities must use facial mask or coverings if requested by a customer and all. Uh, I, don't, I don't feel like that should be in there. I think at some time we start taking away rights versus privileges. But 
that's on uh, just in the personal care business. That's like if you went and get a haircut. Right. Beauty shops. Well, you don't think it's right for the customer to ask if they wouldn't mind wearing a mask? Well, I've got my pages mixed up. Number it's in number five. Facilities should consider requiring employees to have contact with the public to wear mask and coverings. Right, and then it, it's mentioned again, number seven. Right. And I, I just think at some point we start taking away. On the new proclamation, the amended proclamation, that area in number five, because it was not part of CDC's actual recommendations, has been removed. Okay. The state or the CDC? This is the CDC recommendations. I went through the proclamation and what we were doing and compared it back to um, the CDC recommendations as far as what they published for each individual business section. They publish a document for each section that says, here's what you're encouraged to do. And that's what is in this as the best I could, that is what is in the amended proclamation. Now, it does state in there, in some of those uh, spots, it does state, Councilman Edgar, that um, if, like, for example, if a hairdresser, if the customer comes in and asks, before you work on my hair, I want you to put on masks and gloves, then that shop owner or that person doing the uh, hair or the manicure would be required to put on a mask See, and gloves but that's at the customer's request I struggle request, with not that because request. if I was the barber I would say if I'm not going to do that if you feel free go somewhere else that's a freedom we're right. trying to make it a right I mean right we're I think we're crossing that line and I'm sure Mr. Petty doesn't want to get into constitutional law but right at some point we're we're saying you as a business owner have to make cakes for everybody but I don't like Sean, so I don't want to make him well, a cake. Well, That's and, my choice, and, and I, guess, I don't want to take that away. I guess that if <clears> on the same, <throat> say on the same sentence, where the where the person is asking the shop owner to wear a mask, that shop owner has the right. If they don't okay. want to, they have the right to say, "I'm not going to." Is this written in such a way the shop owner can do it? Because uh, I read it like the, I, I think that gets down to their own business. If they want to, if they, if they want to, if they're in need of the business, they will do it. If they are not in need of the business or they don't, they just feel strong enough that they don't have to do it, they're not going to do it, then they can say, I'm not going to do that. And then that customer can make the decision as to whether or not they stay at that location or go somewhere else. If that's how this is written, I'm good with that. That's not how I understand it. Okay, that's the way I understand it. And I mean, sir, if you'd like to. Hello, Rex Howard speaking. I do want to point out that one of the things that Miss Terry Salisbury did Can hand out the was the restaurant. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, one of the things Miss Terry Salisbury did hand out is the restaurant and bar guidance it is a flow chart that is current cdc guidance as of today at least for that business sector there were there are other links that could be available for other business sectors they will differ from that but that's the just for your review and i think we've got all those links published on our website uh and if they were available in english and in spanish we've got them we've got both translations there Weeks. So in, in thinking about the question that was being asked, um, one might say yes. Is it on the onus of the customer or on the onus of the business owner to protect the customer? That's an issue that's outside the scope of this. But one, one might also say, do this. does the customer know enough to know when to ask to wear a mask? Do they understand asymptomatic transmission? Part of the issue that we've experienced is it, it sort of requires some, some further guidance is what does contact with a customer entail? What does that mean? 
uh, under what circumstances should a should a, a business owner wear a mask? And so that guideline, those guidelines, and the information is clearly specified in the guidance. And it's guidance. It's not say thou shalt. That's up to you folks and the uh, the civil authorities to decide. But um, the intensity is not to keep to, to deprive anyone of their freedom. But it is also recognizing these are unusual times. And as we open up and make decisions about how to reopen up our communities in our country, uh, how do we be give the best information both to the business community and to the customers on how to do that safely? And how do we get the right information to help us know when it's the right time? Or when we can expand and reopen further and when we might need to back off of it. So it is still really early. We're still doing the best we can to get more data, but and that will help us make those decisions. But um, it's important to be cautious, it's important to be smart about this, and it's important to recognize that these are unusual times. And uh, we do need to, uh, to be responsible for each other and, and uh, think beyond just you know, personal freedom. So sometimes. keep in mind you're in the reddest state, in the reddest county in the nation. <laughs> Pretty much that's probably a fact. <laughs> yes, sir. <clears throat> the majority of my 250 calls where this is how it works. You slowly take away our freedom. Mm -hmm. I promised every constituent that called me that I would do my best not to let that happen, right? At some point, you have to protect yourself as an individual. So while I agree it is unusual times, and I agree, it's irony is, you know, you got a stockbroker's tag agent, a seaboard farm manager, and, or manager, and, <laughs> and a restaurant owner up here making health decisions. For a community right there's a little irony in that for one but the second thing is i don't think it's my obligation to tell someone to wear a mask or not if i could get that done back to my daughter i would get her to pick up her glasses out of her room <laughs> so i think there's a danger i mean i i appreciate your honesty with us but i also want you guys to know it's it's a tough decision for us we really been put in a hard spot with Catherine, this and we I, don't know what's I right i appreciate that sir i appreciate yeah. the difficulty yeah. And, and I'll just say this, Councilman Egger, is that if, you know, my our, the city employees and I are having a hard enough time trying to keep everything that we should be doing in perspective, one of the last things that I want or I would advise my employees to do is go out there and try to figure out how to run somebody else's business. I'm trying, you know, we're trying to operate the city in the best manner we can. I know that you, are, I'm, you know, I come to y'all for advice and y'all have done a wonderful job of giving that advice. Uh, but yeah, I think the last thing we're gonna do is go into a style shop and question somebody as to why they're not wearing a mask. Uh, we get a lot of those phone calls. So-and-so oh, yeah. -and -so is operating their business not wearing a mask, and they're, you know, this place isn't social distancing and things like that. If we get there and we can make part of it, we will, we will treat it as a priority, and we will try to go educate the educate, and I think that's part of our job is to try to help educate the people. Hey, you know, we got a complaint. This is what it was. Here's the reason... And here's what we've asked you to do. And it would be the same thing as like for a style shop or a barber or anything else if, um, where, it, where it says, if the customer asks, you need to put on a mask. Well, if they don't want to, you're right. That customer has the option to go somewhere else. I just want to make sure and we don't lock anything into the future today right. that we didn't want locked in under a different rule than <clears throat> us, right? I think that's very important. And sometimes we need to be cautious of that. Uh, so if we're not doing that, I'm okay with the proclamation. But if there's even a hint that we may be, I'm not. I'll be honest. I, I have, that is not, I'll, tell, I'll be honest with you, that is not how I've advised the employees, and that's not I, how I will advise them. Right. Uh, I have this not heard our employees. Law, it's required. Huh? Yeah. I have not, I have not heard of our employees getting, um, going out and telling somebody have. you have to wear a mask i think that it, as a business in a business setting like here when we go to open our doors or when walmart opens 
they had the option to say, we would like for you to wear a mask in our facility. Yeah, you wear it when you come and pay, you get finished and you don't like it, you can throw it in the trash as you walk out. If you don't want to put it on, there's other ways you can make your payment. And I'm good with that. Yeah. But um, that gets back to the business and how are we trying to protect our employees. Yeah. So I think to the health department and the, and the CDC, are we giving, is there a way to get these to all the business owners? Are we, is that kind of our plan? I mean, I think we're kind of at the point, if you guys disagree, please let me know, is all we can do now is educate the public because there are so many misconceptions and in the, in the, you know, the, there's typically five of us up here and we're trying to educate in a week 250 phone calls on what, what you can't do, what you can do. And, and, and so for us, we're exhausted. I mean, I'm going to be honest. I'm exhausted. I'm mentally drained from this situation. I, I can't even have a normal night some nights with my family because there's so many phone calls over whatever it is because we don't want to feel like we're taking people's rights but that is not our goal and I don't think that's your guys' goal. But are we to the point now where we just need to educate the public? Because I feel like we're here and there's no way of stopping this. I mean, we're in the middle of a pandemic. It's not going to go away tomorrow. It's not going to go away in two days from now. No one has a crystal ball when this is going to go away. I think we're to the point now where we can only educate people to slow the spread and try to play a little bit of defense. But the only way we're going to play defense is we continue to educate people. And so if, if we can get this in the hands of our citizens, I think this is the only way we can realistically go. And I'll be more than happy to, to get some of my staff to print some of those up and take them to, if it's a restaurant, if it's a salon or that. We can do that. And, and I agree, education is a big part of it. That's part of the reason CDC is even here, is, is we have been working hard on some PSAs for radio and um, well, Facebook, social media, that sort of thing. So, yes, sir, we'll, we'll work on that, and, okay. and I'll try to get out the, what's appropriate for the business. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank okay. you. we got one quick question as far as uh, page three, number four. Are the swimming pool still closed? Okay. The way I understand is this, this through June 9th? The way I understand this, the way it's written, that the swimming pool will be closed until June 9th. Okay. Basketball courts, outdoor exercise stations. Playgrounds if, are closed. If they are if they are city owned public facilities. So did we block those off because there's been people on all the playgrounds and yeah, that was we have not there. blocked those off. So that so in, in my opinion is we're telling people we, they can't go out there, but we have no I I'm just trying to figure out, I mean if someone goes and shoots baskets, are they are they at risk? I mean, obviously, it's if it's you and your, your dad, you know. Mr. Livingood, uh, this is Scott Sudwick. So the, the issue is not so much uh, where you are, it's what you're doing there. So, for example, we know that COVID doesn't survive in chlorinated pool water. It's not the water to stay. It's, it's your proximity to someone else who's bathing in the pool. If you're communicating, enforcing, encouraging social distancing, you can do these activities safely. We do recommend outdoor activity. It, there are real social, psychological, and physical costs to, to being stuck at home. You know that. Um, we want to get people out there and be having healthy behaviors, but do it in a safe way. Um, shooting baskets, again, why can't you spend some time with your kids? You want to shoot some baskets. Within your own home, home unit, it's not a bad idea. So you can start mixing with other folks. You start you know, merging your bubbles, so to speak. You know? Then you start getting some, into some trouble. It's about how you go about doing that. It's not so you, you know, you must do it this way. It's just this is the, what we know has worked elsewhere. Um, and to follow up back on, what, on your ask about communication, uh, I, I, we would like to support uh, the community, uh, your city, and the health department achieve that goal. If there is a, an idea uh, on how you would like to uh, promote that communication, 
uh, with your business community. Um, we would like to support that. Um, we would like your feedback on how to make that happen in partnership with you. Maybe you have some ideas through the City uh, Chamber of Commerce or some other way, but there are multiple ways to get that, that message out, and we would like to explore that and to get that, uh, that information. Just let us know what you think would be helpful and where you think it would, would need to go, and we'll do our best to uh, facilitate that. Can I make a suggestion on that? Since the schools, we have, what, 40 different dialogues here, and the school is furnishing lunches and breakfast every day for the children. If we could get those packages in with their lunches or our breakfast, and they can take them home, and maybe the kids can interpret what we're trying to tell their parents. Well, we've, I, I think it's an excellent suggestion, uh, Councilman. Children tend to be more tech savvy, as you know, and they also uh, can be an, uh, a, a great way to help their elders and folks who are less literate understand some of the complex information that's out there. And the schools have been, as you rightfully pointed out, a great resource for information and community support. That's a wonderful idea. And what we would also like to do, perhaps, and when we are hoping to do in the limited time we, he we are here, is to reach out to the school, uh, school system and see if there might be some ways to do that. What, what we'd like to do, perhaps, is, is, is suggest that um, if there is a set of information uh, that would be valuable for, for uh, schools and their families, we can provide that information and facilitate. Um, you decide how you want to do that, and uh, uh, we'll give you what you need uh, to the best of our ability. But that's an excellent idea. That's, those kind of creative solutions uh, are, are, are really excellent. So, Scott, we have a very large lunch program that Larry's speaking of for our community. Very, very large, probably more percentage wise than what you would see somewhere else. I think it would probably target where you want to be targeting to. Mm -hmm. would, would that be through? Who do I need to contact for that? Because for the school. Maybe Just Sally Hawkins at Bank of the Panhandle would be a good start. And she oh, can, or Angela Rhodes, the yeah, school, Angela Rhodes and school Angela. superintendent. Yeah. She's okay. So. All right, I'll contact her. So, Mr. Petty, did you ever give us a definition on 5B and 7B in the proclamation? While he looks at that, Rex Scott. Um, Terry, I'd like to thank you guys for enduring our questions and helping our community. It's muchly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. On five uh, five B, is that one that? Yes, sir. Well, that language to me is clearly a, a recommendation. Uh, should consider requiring. Okay. What about seven B? I don't think that is mandatory. Seven B, employees must use. That's a that's a mandatory requirement if the customer requests it. Okay. I'm not the author of these, by the way. All right. I would make a, so you said 5B, 5B was not. Yeah, 5B is clearly a suggestion. Suggestion. Uh, facility should consider requiring employees to wear masks. Okay. So, uh, that's a optional, clearly so an optional item. I would. Language in 7B, uh, that word must, yeah. Is a, is a mandatory uh, requirement if the customer required it. So, well, if, if that, if the that, you know. the last sentence in number five says comply with at least the following standards. That's what I thought might make be binding, just like seven B. So I know yeah. there's. Yeah. No, I I, I still think okay. I still think five B is just a. Discretionary item. Okay. 
So I know that the city's been contacted, and I was contacted today about um, obviously the seniors are getting ready to, to graduate. And with this, this closes the activity center, correct? That is correct. This, this closes the community center. Okay. Would it close the parking lot, though, if they were distanced appropriately. six foot apart appropriately? I know inside shut down. The reason we're bringing it up is a group of parents, obviously their kids haven't had the appropriate send off to into their adult life and into college. And, and so some of the parents wanted to get the seniors out there in their cap and gown, spread them apart the parking lot, make a route for community members and family to drive by with a sign and just express their congratulations to their furthering their education or moving into the to the workforce and so that that's the question i mean we're gonna have to the city's gonna have to give them guidance i mean where do, where do we go i mean if they want to do it on main street we do the social distancing that would be an availability if they wanted to Main Street isn't specifically closed. It's just, I mean, the community center was specifically closed. That's and that was my interpretation. If, if y'all would like to help me understand, you know, uh, I mean, we can tell on Main know. Street. My only concern with Main Street is obviously going to get really packed well, really quick. I, mean, I, 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 just, well, I, I and I don't have a problem using using the parking lot of the community center if that fits within the. Um, the the scope of what we're trying to do which is prevent the spread and as the people here kind of said the, the way i understood it was top five top five ways to prevent the spread are to number one social distance number two proper hygiene number three masks and the proper usage of those so, I mean, if we are doing something, if they are going to be able to do something and keep the people, keep the kids six to ten feet apart. If they did ten feet, that'd be less than roughly, what, 1,700 feet? So. Well, I think number six kind of hits us right. It says, uh, businesses where persons gather for presentation or entertainment, it would be a presentation, would it not be? Correct. But it's not inside. It's outside. Well, it's got sporting venues, places of worship. So at the risk of the CDC talking about me later, <coughs> at what point does quality of life, do we start ruining quality of life, right? I, I think we didn't, they didn't have prom. They didn't have graduation. If they really make an effort to social distance 10 foot apart, I, as a city, think we have got to overlook that because at some point we are taking quality of life away from people if they're trying to do it at some point. And if they're putting forth a good faith effort to, to, to do everything that they're supposed to be doing, I think we ought to let them, you know, it gets down to also their choice. Right. If they don't feel safe, they yeah, should. Some, if they don't feel safe, are probably not don't do it. Some, some won't probably participate because that's yeah. a personal choice and that's your right. Um, but obviously we're going to ask people to to be responsible for themselves and hey, keep your separation, obviously no congregating. Save me, Scott. Come on, buddy. I, I, I think that, uh, you know, I, my, my son graduated, uh, graduated, uh, graduated from high school uh, this year and he didn't have a prom, he didn't have a uh, graduation. And you know, we're trying to do things with him, uh, you know, just uh, with, as a family. And he understands these are, are unusual times but the other side is he, did, he does miss that connection with his peers, and this is a special import, you know, important time. And other, other communities have been creative, and across the country trying to solve a similar thing. And you probably caught talking with their counterparts in other, in other uh, communities. I know, Mayor, you probably touch a lot with folks in Oklahoma. And there have been some great solutions. I mean, I, I saw one where you have a, a big space uh, at the activity center, kind of like a drive-in theater. I mean, again, if you're keeping families together, it's less of a problem than if they're mixing, you know, have cars. That'd be sort of like a, like a drive-in movie theater. And that's what that's Goodwill did. Well, yeah. and that's what they're gonna be doing for graduation. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's all kinds of different things. Yeah, so what the high school's already doing that for graduation. Goodwill did it, uh, which is 10 miles down the road. They did it last Friday night, similar situation. I think 
really it's just we got to encourage people to just follow the guidelines and, and be smart about it and protect yourself. This, this number one is suspension of scheduled events at these city facilities. So if, you, if the kids do something that it's not a scheduled item, I don't know that that would prevent it. So they can have their impromptu, the way I understand that is they can have their impromptu uh, send off. Send off. <laughs> Not a schedule today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if the glove doesn't fit. <laughs> personal yeah, personal choice. Yeah, personal choice. <laughs> Any other discussion? Well, with, with the thought of making this meeting longer than what it should be uh, do we want to address and maybe I need some clarification on uh, number four which says the following city owned public publicly accessible facilities are closed playgrounds swimming pool basketball courts outdoor exercise stations at all the city owned public, publicly accessible sports fields and courts, social distancing of participants and spectators must be maintained. I mean, uh, if we follow CDC, I think, I think it's CDC's guidelines, and like for the swimming pool, because uh, it can be easily done, cut the. Um, Capacity in half, for example, that you know, and try you know, and try to keep that social distancing. I mean, I just know how important the pool is to everybody, and that'll be the next thing that we hear is that why aren't you opening up the pool next weekend? It's the desire of the council, just strike that, just strike, eliminate the question. Just okay. Strike the. Yeah, if we're going to open it up the night, then might as well just have it opened up. And if and the key is the social distancing, and then we can always close it if we have to. Yeah, I think I think you, with that, you open obviously the city-owned public sports fields right. with the guidelines of social distancing, no groups, ten or more. Stuff, those guidelines that have been given. Um, Rather than restricting or taking things away, you're saying, you know, in some ways, we want, we recognize the value in these things too, and this is part of our community, and you want these things, help us make it available to you by, by ensuring that you're taking care of the thing so we don't have to ratchet it back, right. you know, we give them opportunity <coughs> and more control over their, their, their community and their lives. Yeah. I appreciate that. Thank you. I think you just strike the first sentence, the number four. Yeah. Right. <laughs> So I'd like to make a motion that we approve. I've got one more thing. <laughs> since since it is kind of, is it is it under our purview to close the fairgrounds and community center since that's county operating property? Uh, I think the uh, it's within the city. I think we, it, it is leased to the county, but I think the city still has some okay. jurisdiction yeah. over there. The uh, police department, for example, can can uh, restore law and order if there's some problem out just, there. Just a question. I knew we owned it. It was a lease. Yeah. 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 It is. It is leased to the county, but I think the uh, ordinance okay. proclamation is still. Applied. So if I get this wrong, help me, Larry. Okay. <laughs> So I'd like to make a motion that we approve the proclamation of a state of emergency with the omission of number four, the first line, and the omission of seven. Be the first sentence yeah, number four. And then number seven, B, I would like to have pulled out. Where it says must, for sure. Kim, are you comfortable with the alcohol now? Well, the, the, Other than that, that part of the, is that part, will that be part of the ordinance, Mr. Petty, the first two pages? 
Or will the ordinance, will the proclamation start with now therefore it is the, 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 the proclamation begins at, uh, I'm trying to lick my finger through this math. Uh, the proclamation begins at the next to the last paragraph on page two. Yeah. So from there, there down is what you're proclaiming. Everything up above is simply uh, that one paragraph recites the Oklahoma statute. Right. Uh, but the proclamation is only from the second paragraph on page bottom of page two on down through page three and but that, that was my assumption yeah. so i'd like to make that motion yeah. i have a motion do i have a second no second i have a motion and a second peterson aye edgar aye swager aye living good aye we've got four eyes okay um Thank you guys, the CDC, for coming out. I appreciate it very much. Um, you guys have been really helpful. If there's anything you need from the city, obviously feel free to contact one of us and we can probably help you get with the right person. And Ms. Salisbury, thank you for coming out and educating us a little bit tonight. So thank you guys for coming out. We'll stand adjourned. Thank you.